Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be with you in this new year. It's hard to imagine that uh, it's already that, but it is. Yeah, eight days in, January 8th, yeah. Yep, and uh, today in the church year is the observance or celebration of the baptism of our Lord. When Jesus came to John, that'll be one of the, the gospel lesson that we will take a look through uh, this morning. We'll also take a look at Isaiah's prophecy that called forth that uh, uh, that time and uh, the joyous occasion of Jesus' baptism. So, uh, ready to begin with the collect? Yeah, absolutely. Right, so let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling, as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, so we'll go right to Isaiah chapter 42. This is, like you said, the prophecy that points to uh, Christ so clearly. The first of, I think there's five servant songs in Isaiah? I think there's, I think there's four. four. Okay. Four, yeah, I think it's four. Yeah, so this is uh, the first of the servant songs, and these are passages in Isaiah's prophecy that point so clearly to Christ. And um, in some places, it's Christ himself speaking, and then in this instance, it's the Father, you can hear the Father's voice through Isaiah speaking of, of Christ. So. And it's interesting, this song is sung immediately after God points out the futility of the idols that they have been worshiping or following and so forth, as opposed to these, now he announces the kind of servant or the servant he will choose. Yeah, yeah, listen to the last verse of chapter 41. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. And so in response to that, we, we get our passage here. And, so, And those are the people's choices yep. for God. Here's his choice. Yep. So verse uh, chapter 42, verses 1 through 9 of Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So far, our reading. So. Yeah, it's an interesting, this is divided into the two sections. He identifies his chosen servant and how he will deal with the people, but also, the, the, he, in, uh, like you said, the, the empty wind as opposed to the spirit right. that he's going to give. His spirit he will give to him and so forth. But what he'll do is the bringing forth of justice to the nations this is not worldly justice, but God's justice mm -hmm. that both deals with the sin that must be justly dealt with, but also in a way that redeems the one caught in that justice. And then the idea of crying out uh, and lifting up his voice to make it heard, and then how he deals with people, these beautiful images. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will be. He will faithfully bring forth justice, and I love the the other part that we tend to fail in uh, to is, he will not grow faint or be discouraged, till he has established justice, and I always think of that, in terms of, nothing shall separate us from the love of the Lord in Romans. This mm -hmm. saving work, it it can't grow tired. It won't grow weary, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I love the. I love that we placed it immediately before we even read into the context of of chapter forty one. Because, like you said, the the false idols and and those take so many forms still in our day. Uh, the things we turn to instead of God, and and they're nothing. They're empty wind. And and here it is. God says, "Behold, my servant, and whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights." And then I have put my spirit, as you kind of alluded to, that is the same word for wind that, that's there. So it's, it's just a, a, such a beautiful reality of what Jesus is for us, the only thing we need in the face of a world of so many alternatives, but those alternatives are really no alternative at all. And God's pointing so clearly to the one who was to come. And it's a, it's a radical contrast. And then he flips in verse 5 to talk about what, who he is, the God who created, spread out the earth, gave breath to people, and spirit uh, to those who walk in it. And then he declares, I am the Lord. Now he changes from creator to his redemptive work. Mm -hmm. I have called you in righteousness, again, from where your sin had left you, and so forth. And all the things that he will do, you know, I love that first person, you know, he starts out, I am the Lord. As such, this is what I do. Then he says in 8 again, I am the Lord, that's my name, my glory I will give to another. What he's referring to, he's not going to give his glory to another. It literally refers to the fact that his work that glorifies him cannot be done by another. Mm -hmm. it, it's only he who can do it. Uh, and, you know, he says, the former things have come to pass and new things I declare. And I love that, before they spring forth. And, and this is always an anticipating, and all these verses give hope. Mm -hmm. They promise a future greater than where their idols had left them. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, jumping back to the beginning, one of the things that we see here in uh, verse 1 is, um, will show up again in our, our gospel reading, is we have all three persons of the, the Trinity that are um, mentioned here. Um, and, and that first one is that God the Father is the one speaking, and he's speaking of his servant, who is uh, Jesus Christ, the one in whom my soul delights. And then um, it, he says, I put my spirit upon him, which we'll see happen at his baptism account in just a little bit. So it's a great Old Testament uh, appearance of the, the Trinity showing up here. And um, it, it's, it, it, isn't, it isn't just the Father, it isn't just the Son, it isn't just the Spirit, but they're always working together. And that God's declaration, as we'll hear in the baptism, this is my beloved son, especially with whom I am well pleased, that is God identifying him as my chosen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it fills that in so wonderfully. Now, one of the things that's also kind of in here that it, it, it's, it seems obvious, but when he says, my servant, and that's one of the most striking things when it comes to Jesus and his ministry, is the people could not believe and trust that this man Jesus was actually God's anointed, God's Messiah, God's chosen one. Why? Because he did not fulfill the expectations they had of him. And yet we see the expectations God has of him mm -hmm. here in this that he actually does fulfill in terms of justice and righteousness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, so the, the original recipients of this, these people were in exile, right? The, the first... Uh... This, I think this is prior to exile. I could be wrong. Okay. I, I think this is before they go. Okay, yeah. Some of the, some of the things I, I was reading said that this was the first exile had potentially occurred at this point already. And so people were hearing about this servant who would be a better alternative to the, the falsehoods that they were holding on to. And, and, and so the... And whether it was after the exile or leading up to the exile, there was a lot of oppression that God's people were facing at this time. And so, so the point that I um, found that was pretty interesting is that people were thinking, okay, we have all this, this governmental, this political, and, and even military oppression coming against us, but here the Lord's servant is going to become one who comes in peace. He's going to come without even raising his voice. He's, he's not going to... Uh, um, he, he's not going to, to do it with uh, a, a military might situation. It's going to be his, his calm, um, pervasive presence of peace that, that Jesus brings. Yeah, and one of the things that I had read is they're on the verge of heading to exile. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that they're running into the reality of, which is in 41, is all these things they've worshipped and bowed down to are failing them. Mm -hmm. They're running into the failure of all of the idols and all the things that they had set up as their, their go-to in trouble. And in the midst of him telling, well, this is why this is happening. But in the midst of this, behold, I'm going to literally, that word emphasizing the reality, in the midst of this failure, I got something new. And this is, is what it is. And most interesting part, I love that he will not raise his voice. They're expecting G, the, the God to do battle with the, the, the nations that are coming against them and so forth. And Jesus does battle with the true evil that's coming against them. Not by sword or shouting or, or a word, but by silence. It's such an interesting uh, forerunner because that, that's foreshadowing how Jesus, before all the power of Rome and all the power of the religiously corrupt, he says nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's just an interesting thing how he's establishing justice by his silence and so forth. So yeah, it's a, it's lots of lots of points of that we'll see fulfilled through the ministry of Jesus and so forth. But, uh, yeah, one of the things I love with I am the Lord, I am the Lord, is it echoes back to Moses when uh, he had gone into Egypt to call for Pharaoh to let the people go into the desert for three days to worship him and so forth. And, of course, Pharaoh increases the burden, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth and so on. And Moses basically kind of goes and lays into the Lord that, you know, what you know what, what are you doing? And God's response to Moses is, I am the Lord. Right. And that, it's a clear declaration by God that I will be Lord, I will do my saving work in the way that I have chosen and I have designed, not the one that suits you or is agreeable to you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost doing the same thing here again, this, you know, this is what I am to you, and it's his declaration because I'm this, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, and, and one of those things, um, it's just beautiful the way that God describes it here. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I mean, just picture a father holding a child next to a, a busy street or, or you know, all, all sorts of situations where that, that assuring presence of someone stronger than you is holding you back from danger. Um, and then uh, I, I really think there's so much that we could say about, I will give you as a covenant for the people um, especially, I mean, most obviously when Jesus says, uh, this is a covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. So he literally becomes that covenant, um, not just a keeper of the covenant, but the one who is, the, the law of God is, is seen within and, and perfectly upheld. He, he is that keeping of that, that con communion with God. Okay, and that's my question. Because in that passage in verse 6, it says, I will give you as a covenant for the people. He was giving Jesus as the covenant for the people. In a covenant, there has to be, there's two parties in a covenant. The one, and both have responsibilities to be kept. And the most interesting thing is Jesus is the keeper of our part of the covenant and God's part. Mm -hmm. It's a, such an odd thing, but like, you know, well, I failed in the covenant. Yes, that's true. That's why you cling to Jesus. He's the keeper of the covenant for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, the words that follow that are just, uh, again, another beautiful picture of, of what God does for us. He is our light. He's a light for the nations. We're part of the nations, so uh, a light for the nations opens the eyes that are blind. And, and I, I was actually struck by that. I mean, I think we see so many times the reality that Jesus gave sight to the blind. But here I actually think, and, and love to hear your thoughts on it, it, it actually, I think this is probably a, a metaphorical thing, especially when you put it with the bringing the prisoners out of the dungeon and, and from prison those who sit in darkness this this opening of the eyes to the blind is, is something that happens for us who aren't physically blind but we're blinded by sin that we're now able to see the beauty of the, the world that God intends for us. Okay, I, I agree, I agree. Do you think the blindness though is also in the sense that the Pharisees thought they saw but God said as long as you think you see you're still blind. Jesus tells him that. And the blindness for them was that they were believing something else was the path to God. Works righteousness, if you will. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because of their not knowing the real God, they were imprisoned 
yeah. by their own illusions or their own bondage to the law that they had to save themselves. They had to keep their part of the covenant. But yeah, I agree. I don't think it's he's referring to the physical blindness mm -hmm. and so forth, but that the idea that it's a blindness that is born of the fact you you believe God to, to be other than he is. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a great picture of, of what Jesus does for us. And um, what do you think it's talking about in, in verse 9? The former things have come to pass. Is that all of the Old Testament? Is that our former ways of life? Is that the elementary principles of the world that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 4? Is it... Um, is it something we can pin down? I, I, I don't know. I, uh, it, I don't know that it's... I wouldn't say that it's... The former things basically have come to pass is... At this particular point, everything... I think it points back to everything God has done to bring forth His people to identify the the, uh, the coming of the Messiah, to have uh, uh, choosing a people, deliverance through the baptism in the Red Sea, and so forth, deliverance again through the wilderness. All of these things have been fulfilled. They've been bought, brought to the promised land. It's like the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That has been fulfilled. And in that time, though, God also forecast through Moses that once they had the land, they would completely fall away. Mm -hmm. So it's like everything that God promised He would do and how the people would react, it's come full circle now as they prepare to go into exile. And they're once again lost. They're once again back where Abraham began. Yeah. They're once again going back to where they were in Egypt. Right. I don't know, That that's how I see it. It's a both end of the affirming, saving, and delivering narratives that the promises he gave, but also what he prophesied about the unfaithfulness of the people. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's that's good, and that kind of fits with where where I kind of my my thinking, my understanding of it is that, at least that you know the Lord. I I don't know. This sounds too um, too human thinking of of God's work in the world, but the Lord had allowed people the opportunity to try living according to the law. He allowed them the opportunity to 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 prove themselves, so to speak, and and that's the former things, and and so that that living according to the law, not that it was bad by any stretch, but it was never going to be met by the people. So the Lord's going to intervene in a new way now, and and that's not of the former things. It's it's the new thing that He's going to do. And I, I it it sounds silly, but it, I I almost think that what He's doing is He's bringing the people his own people to the realization of what he says when the Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Yeah. There's no merit. You know, any idea you guys are worthy of this stuff is gone. It's never been that you've been worthy of it. That's why I provided the Day of Atonement. You would prove yourself unworthy through the day. Then they began to take that for granted. Right. And therefore, it, it always drives us back to mercy. You yeah. know, and 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 not dealing with us according to our sin. And that's really what he's emphasizing here in his form of justice, is he doesn't deal with us according to our sin, but according to his doing of justice for us in his servant. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's just, I, I think I, Isaiah is such a beautiful book, and, and the words that follow, Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastland and their ha inhabitants, everybody, let them give glory to the Lord and declare His praises in the coastland. Such a beautiful picture of all-encompassing praise of the Lord's action here that He's promising. And I, I, I think it's just great how Isaiah unfolds this picture in a very prophetic way, very poetic way, of what we see clearly in the Gospels and in Christ's life for us. Now, I don't know if it's true enough, but the idea he calls it, tells him to sing a new song, literally is a message that what you're going to tell people I have done for you, you have not yet been able to tell. Right. We have. It, it's a totally new thing. It's like the mystery being revealed is about to be revealed. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I like, like you said, the Day of Atonement had been a reality for them. 
really was a place where God intervened for them, right. but, the, but there was no tangible tie to to them of how it was possible, and, and then, so Christ comes and shows how this is yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. This this new thing has actually um, been dabbling in the former things throughout all of history, and, I, and it just for me, it's one of the mysteries of God is His timelessness, His able to inter his ability to intervene through the cross, even into the Old Testament, um, and, and we have the benefit of being this side of the cross so we can see how it works, but it's still that same timeless power of God that brings those gifts from, um, wh what, 30 A.D. all the way to our, our 2023 now that we're, we're, we're living from those benefits, the same people, the same kind of benefits that the people of the Old Testament had. And, and his promises of forgiveness or atonement were put to the flesh of animals. And with the coming of Christ, that promise is put in human flesh mm -hmm. to not just die, but to live for, for people. So. Yeah. Well, should we turn to uh, Matthew? Yep. All right. We're in the A series now, the, in the three-year cycle, and uh, the majority of our gospel lessons will be coming from the uh, Matthew's account of the gospel. And we are... Uh, in uh, chapter 3, we're picking up verse 13. This is Jesus coming to, uh, to John. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that is John, consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on, descending like a dove and coming to rest upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus comes from Galilee to Jordan. He had to go from the northern part of Israel down to its southern end uh, to, you know, be there with John because that's the more wilderness region of Israel is in the south and so forth where John was baptizing. Yeah, it says, uh, it says in the footnotes, uh, at least 15 miles, perhaps much further. Um, so this, this journey was at least a day's journey. Uh, oh, fif 15, really, I yeah. think it would be. Because Nazareth, Nazareth is about 30 miles, isn't it, from Jerusalem alone? But uh, could be, could be. I don't, I don't know that. But uh, but he comes to be baptized. He comes to have something happen to him. Okay, he's not coming to do something. He's coming to have something happen to him. And then what unfolds here in the things that do happen is it's things continuously happening to Jesus, not things he's doing. I find that fascinating. Hmm. And it sends back to, to what uh, it comes to. Now, immediately John wanted to prevent him. I need, need to be baptized by you. And it's an interesting declaration. This is a place for sinners, not the sinless. Yeah. Yeah, you know? John knows. This, <laughs> this is very, uh, very indicative of uh, John's awareness of who Jesus is and um, his his role not as one who needs to be judged, but his role as the judge. Um, and and here John is uh, revealing things we don't know from Scripture that whether it was through uh, in interactions with Jesus or through divine revelation directly to John uh, throughout his life, but but John knew more about Jesus than anybody else knew until honestly until. Um, Christ's ascension and then even into Pentecost, John had a, a very prophetic, uh, which is why he's the last of the Old Testament prophets, realization of who Jesus was. And if it, that's, you know, we can't say they're cousins and so forth, but how much they meet, you don't know. But the one thing I read that I it made sense is the fact that his father was a priest serving in the house of God. He would have been familiar, or his father would have taught him, Zechariah would have taught him much about the, the the whole kind, the whole understanding of that salvific event, because 
he, he would have surely participated in the Day of Atonement as a priest and mm -hmm. so forth. And so John had an expectation of what this Messiah would do, this one coming and so forth. But Jesus answers him, he says, let it be so now, uh, for it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It's an interesting phrase in the in the first part of that is is it's we the English we read is let it become so now or let it be so now. It literally in the Greek it points to the idea Jesus is setting let this become now. And it's an interesting transition. It's not an act. It's about it's about Jesus becoming something through his baptism. And the most fascinating part of it is his ministry that he'll take up requires John's participation. Hmm. Because he says here, it's fitting for us yeah. to fulfill all righteousness. So the ministry of John had to be a part of Jesus' ministry. Yeah, that ministry of John being the Word of God. And it, in, in a very real way, Jesus is submitting himself to the Word of God. Yep. And, as the Word of God, submitting himself to the Word of God, and yeah, this this uh, to fulfill all righteousness. That's that's something that um, I think that righteousness word. Um, I think sometimes we have a one-dimensional view of it, where we where we think a righteousness to be righteous just means you're you're leaving, leading life as it should be. You're doing what you're supposed to do. Um, you're innocent, so to speak. But but really, I, I think this uh, word is even at this time had a fuller meaning and Psalm 71 verse 15 is a great place to see that uh, further understanding of what righteousness is and where it says in Psalm 71 15 my mouth will tell of your righteous acts of your deeds of salvation all the day for their number is past my knowledge and in that verse righteous acts and deeds of salvation are placed in parallel to each other showing that they have a connected meaning here and so the fulfill all righteousness this is this is connected to salvation. This is a salvific act that Jesus is doing here. The, the way that I was taught to understand all righteousness is, remember Jesus is, is because he says that, that we read in Isaiah that he will be given as a covenant between God and right. mankind. Yeah. All righteousness is, here's where Jesus is embracing the fact that in him God will be just and the justifier. Because to be righteous is literally to fulfill all of one's responsibilities in a relationship. Mm -hmm. All right, Jesus, as the Son of God and the Son of Man, in this moment comes to fulfill all the righteousness of God towards us and all of our righteousness yeah. together. They're met in this moment. Yeah. So that in the end, there is that reconciliation. There is that peace. There is forgiveness because... He has fulfilled the righteous demands of God, both that we be punished, but also the righteousness of God that in his relationship he is the provider of salvation. But he's also fulfilled our part of the righteousness of living the perfect life and paying the penalty for our failure. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a far sweeping thing. And uh, what this is in many ways is, you know, then John consents uh, and I, th I think it's fascinating that repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sin is part of the righteousness. We tend to think of it as the negative side of it, and yet it's still a, a part of that whole making righteous. It's just a, you know, that, that work with that. But then it emphasizes uh, when he went up out of the water, uh, I think it's fast. I was reading a thing that said, Priests, Jewish men who went into the priesthood, at the age of 30, they were washed with water as a consecrating act to begin their service as a priest. Really? Yeah. I had not heard that before. Yeah, and so Jesus, we're assuming, is roughly about 30. He's taking up that priestly role and so forth. He, too, is now washed or consecrated, uh, set apart for his uh, prophetic ministry or his high priestly work of offering himself. And then uh, saw the Spirit descending, the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and coming to rest on him. Again, the anointing of the Spirit. That It's not that Jesus doesn't have the Spirit, but now he is given the Spirit as the means 
to commence his ministry. So yeah. it's all are involved. Yeah, it, and so I, I don't know. This isn't like at this point now. Now he's got the Spirit of God with him, so now he knows what he's supposed to do. It, I feel like that's debunked even within this because he comes to John and he says we have to do this. It's right. necessary to fulfill all righteousness or fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And so it's not as if then Jesus is uh, theological or, or spiritual eyes were open to see his role as the Savior of the world. I, I think he was uh, privy to that when we go to the 12-year-old um, Jesus in the, the temple when, when he got left behind and he said, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? So I think I, I think this is... Um, just kind of his anointing that now it's ready, set, go. This is this is the beginning where where it begins to unfold. It's not like Jesus is now. Oh, I have stuff to do here on earth. It's it's this is when it begins. Well, and it's fascinating because he doesn't allow the apostles to begin their apostolic ministry until the Spirit comes. Yeah, it's already, he already they already had the Spirit because he had breathed on them and gave it to them. Yeah, but with the commissioning. To begin it, yeah, that's a good parallel there. Yeah, yeah, to that that they wait for that same spirit, and so forth. Now the interesting thing here, though, is is God's voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. There are several indicators here that I, I find fascinating. Is that it is God's declaration that he this he trusts Jesus to be the one to fulfill. The messianic work, the saving work, and the fact that he says it to him as his son. This is my son, the son of God, who's found in the flesh. Also indicates that the the way in which Jesus will do it in human flesh is also pleasing to God. Right. It's a, it, it's it's a, such a bold declaration here, and at this moment. It's also, again, that what I had read is God is saying, ah, this is the one uh, I am pleased to be both just and the justifier of all people. <coughs> right. That so many things are fulfilled in this moment. And it's like going forward. And then it's said here as he begins his ministry, and then it's affirmed again at the transfiguration as he heads towards the, uh, the actual sacrifice on the cross. Mm -hmm and so forth, making it clear that everything to this point is pleasing, and now as he prepares to offer himself, he again is pleasing uh, to me, and that, you know, and the, the uh, transfiguration, the Lord says, uh, be hearing him, or be listening to him. Yeah, yeah and uh, just to point out, just like in uh, Isaiah 42, verse 1, we see all three persons of the Trinity present here, uh, Father, whose, whose voice is heard, the Spirit who descends in the form of the dove, and of course, Jesus, who's uh, submitting himself to, to John's baptism here, so all three of them are present, and and so just to point out or remind you, the 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 uh, what do you call it, the rare dose behind our altar at Trinity is a depiction of this this scene as the hand from heaven is. Um, it's hard to represent a voice coming from heaven, but the hand of God acting coming from heaven. That's the hand at the top, and then the cross represents Christ, where he went ultimately for our sins and then the the dove is here and so this is this is a place where we get the spirit as the dove in scripture i was it's a bit of trivia but i was reading the hand <laughs> yeah that was actually introduced in middle age art in the middle e medieval times into the art to make sure that in pictures of his baptism god's presence was known and the fact the hand comes through the cloud was depicting heaven torn open Hmm. The heavens opening, yeah, but yeah. The, the hand coming down was a way of doing that. Now, what's fascinating here in these these two things you mentioned the the triune God in creation, God said, "Let us make man in our own image." Now you have the three, the Trinity is here again, and basically by God's voice declaring, "Let us now redeem and remake man in our image." Hmm. And this the the new creation concept of of coming to to make it again because. It, it's a fascinating thing. Jesus, everybody that came to John came confessing their sin. Jesus comes and God confesses him. Yeah. It's like an interesting the flip there that, you know, God is confessing who he is and and through our baptism to you know, tied to him, as the Son of God was united to human flesh, we are united to both of those in our baptism and hear that same declaration 
that we are a member of his family, an inheritor, a son, and that through this Jesus we are uh, mm -hmm. pleasing to him. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about this, um, this declaration from God? Do you think everybody present heard that? Um, and, and I'll just skip to the one of my conclusions on it. I think if, if they heard it, they didn't get it. Because um, it wasn't as if at this point everybody now respects Jesus and says, oh, this is the Son of God. There's huge mystery surrounding him. And even as he con begins and continues his early ministry, at, at least he's, he's kind of downplaying his role as a Son of God so that sure. um, his ministry can continue would be my... Um, conclusion in that, but but do you think the people around heard that, or was that for Jesus? I I don't know. I would say it's definitely Jesus to hear. It is, but it's a declaration. He doesn't say, you are my son. He yeah, says, this right. is my son. Yeah. So it is a declaration to everyone witnessing it. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing, I, I don't know if they heard it, because most times, whenever God speaks to Jesus, Save maybe the Mount of Transfiguration. Everybody says it sounded like a thunder. Yeah, we get it's somewhere in John nine or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that that I I have and I will glorify it again. You know, they thought it thundered or something, and I I I don't know. John in his testimony doesn't say, well, I saw the dove and I heard God say this. It's not part of his witness, so I I don't know. But I like what you're saying because. The reason Jesus didn't want people to know that he was quote unquote so much the Son of God, or that his miracles was because, as as he points out in the one after feeding the 5,000, is that they basically would put a human interpretation on the event instead of a divine and salvific mm -hmm. interpretation on the event, and so forth. But I, 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 That's a good question. I don't know. But <clears throat> the Holy Spirit clearly uh, inspired Matthew to record these events. Right. Now, whether Matthew knew John or not, I, you know, John the Baptist, I, I don't know. But that's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So, and then immediately after this, he's he goes into the temptation of the wilderness, and I, I don't want to get into that story too much, but I think it's interesting to note out um, this is the first Sunday in Epiphany, as um, today is Epiphany. Happy Epiphany, by the way. We're recording on on January 6th. Right, right, it <laughs> so, is. But January 8th is um, two days after Epiphany, so we're in Epiphany now, uh, but but the next... No, 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 no. Epiphany's tomorrow. Epiphany's tomorrow, well, happy January Epiphany 6th. Eve. Or uh, uh, Merry Christmas for the last day of Christmas. Today again. is the 5th. Yeah, oh, so, I, I knew uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> but I get what you're saying. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so anyways, so our Epiphany season leads right into the Lent season, and so our first Sunday in Lent, we'll get to the next the next scene in uh, Matthew chapter 4 and, and that it's makes, so beautiful and that makes me wonder if that declaration was meant for Satan mm. oh that's another angle that I wasn't considering because he does go immediately out in the wilderness yeah and, and, and now Satan targets him and he keeps saying because Satan wouldn't have known he was his son yeah but he says well if you are the son of God and I don't know, that's what I, it's always been in the back of my mind, is yeah. if it was said for Satan and his minions to know, because even Jesus in the synagogue, they right away know who he is. Mm -hmm. But the fact he's veiled in flesh is they perceive he has the same weakness as the Pharisees did of any other man. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thing. So yeah, we'll, we'll get into the ministry of Jesus, but the, the season of Epiphany that we're in now really begins with, it appropriately begins with the baptism of Jesus because this is God declaring, this is God um, announcing, this is God endorsing that Jesus is who he is. Yeah. So he's revealed to us, which is what Epiphany means. And yeah, so we'll revelation. see um, we'll see miracles of Jesus in Epiphany. We'll see the, the act of God through the Son of God, God himself, Jesus, as he um, yeah. begins his ministry. Yeah, he will demonstrate his divinity in these events, like here rebuking Satan, he reveals his divinity by being the word, saying the word, right. you know, and following the word, the idea of the fasting and so forth, and each of those things. It's it's the idea of him manifesting or, or displaying his divinity. It's not that he doesn't do it the rest of the year, but these are particularly important because they're introductory right. uh, things revealing that, because Epiphany also includes the first miracle of the 
changing the, the water into wine right. too and so forth. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, guess just long story short, I just love the church years flow as as we. Kind of, it seems like we're jumping around in Jesus's life, but if you step back and look at the the highlights, we have had Christmas, we've had now Jesus baptism, and then we'll get Jesus temptation at the beginning of the next season, and so those are seasonal things. And then at the end of Lent, we'll get to Jesus death and resurrection, and and then the cycle kind of continues. And and in the days after Lent, Easter, we we get into the stories of Jesus' ministry during the, the season of Pentecost. So, I mean, it's just a, a beautiful way to see the rhythm of, of the ministry of Christ unfold in our regular readings in the church. And, and here we are um, very appropriately at Jesus' baptism, kind of beginning um, his ministry. Yeah, and it, it's such an interesting journey, though, too, in the sense that his the way that the way the church has had us walk with Jesus through these cycles and so forth, it's amazing how much these also parallel our life. Mm -hmm. Is once we're brought to the faith and so forth, we immediately deal with the wrestling of Satan. Yeah. And yet we continuously see God's manifesting his power through word and sacrament to us even while we are. And there's times of repentance and so forth. Then there's times of growth and doing and so forth. And it's it's just an interesting, you know, kind of a, a journey for that as well. But, uh, and this is, I guess, a lot of people, I was reading a thing that where they were talking about how the, many po people believe this event is un, uh, why, what's that matter to me? Mm -hmm. And so forth. And what they don't quite get is, it's kind of what I mentioned at, at, uh, on Christmas Eve is, you know, you can believe this thing happened. But the most critical thing is you have to believe he's being baptized for you. He's not being baptized for himself because everything he's doing is for you. Yeah. And, and you know, it's such a critical... And then he ties you to his baptism for you when he baptizes you. But notice in each of these things, uh, John baptizes him. He receives that. The Holy Spirit, he receives the Holy Spirit. Then he receives the voice of God, the, the blessing of God upon him, and so forth. Then with these things coming out of that water, then he begins his, his ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well. So which one are you preaching on? I haven't decided yet. <laughs> I don't know. We, we are we're, uh, leaving, uh, commend it to you, Romans chapter 6. Those uh, oh, yeah. the first 12 verses are the... Uh, Talks about our baptism. The epistle reading today, and, and that's such a powerful text. I might end up preaching on that one with these as um, supporting uh, materials for yeah. it. Yeah, this baptism of Jesus is him being sealed to you and me in, ba in through his baptism. Romans 6 emphasizes that through our baptism we are sealed or united to him. It's, it's just the, the other size of the, the hourglass, the narrow of it. Yeah. Yeah, what about you? What are you preaching on? I'm going to preach on, on this one. I just I just think it's... I, I, I think one of the reasons that a lot of people's faith can run, mine too, run into some numbness or some uncertainty and so forth, because we always have the world, even more than ever before, thrown into us as if it's all monumental and stuff like that, is... is this emphasizes the Son of God coming to meet us in a place that isn't big or wonderful or fantastic. It's just simple water. And in that simple water, he does divine things, holy things, and so forth. And I just think that's such, such a critical thing for us to, to keep in mind is the profundity of God entering into the smallest of things to meet us whom, who sin has made the smallest of things. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that's, that's kind of where I'm going, is what what this means he's there to do for you, I think is where I'm going. Yeah, it's, it seems like a, a simple afternoon encounter with his cousin and um, doesn't seem uh, just on the surface. He, he goes under the water, and um, but once he once John baptizes him, he hits all of us on that afternoon. Yeah. He he 
a bird lands on him. I mean, just looking from the outsider appearance, there's a, a loud boom. I mean, what's what does this have to do for the history of humanity? But, but yeah, there's such beauty in the the workings going on here. Yeah, just uh, and that's yeah the word. It's just so. But that's what I'm going to work on. Very cool. Well, God bless you in that, and uh, may He bless us in our hearing and uh, our living in Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's see. Uh, we're back to school now. Uh, kids are back from their uh, Christmas break and so forth. I don't recall. Uh, we do have uh, your your uh, uh, what's the Bible say? Uh, yeah. Resumes Monday nights at seven. Yeah, we'll probably be um, into next week on the sixteenth, just because we got circuit meeting on, That's on, true. The, yep. on the ninth yep. here. But so. Uh, yeah, I haven't talked to Pastor Mapus about that yet, but I think... Uh, I but, think he... Is he back from... Yeah, he, he, he should be back in Florida. I didn't want to bug him yet, but I think he's... Yeah, he was on vacation in Florida, so I think the 16th, and we'll uh, get into that. Sunday mornings, we're starting a Bible study of the Lutheran Difference. We'll be looking at uh, basic teachings of the faith, and I think I got 18 of them up on my board over here to guide us through. We're starting with the Word of God, what we believe about the Word of God, but then we'll actually um, kind of spend some time talking about different opinions on the Word of God. And we'll go through uh, the Word of God, we'll go through creation, angels, demons, the Holy Spirit, predestination, baptism, prayer, confession, uh, a long list of things, like I said, about 18 different topics. It'll take us through through May, and we'll, we'll see what we believe, and then where you might hear differences and, and how we wrestle with those differences. Ideally, we'll be able to be confident in what we know and, and be able to give a defense for the hope that we have within us um, when we're, we're talking with our, our Christian brothers and sisters in this world. Absolutely. Uh, you can join us Wednesday morning at 10 in the Luther Room. This last week we did an intro to the book of Hebrews. We'll start reading chapter 1. This Wednesday we had a nice group. We had 18. Oh, great. So glad to see a good group there, good discussion. So. That's good. And uh, if you want to go to the walleye game with us, January 29th, uh, 515 game, we got tickets available in the office, $17 a piece, so a uh, uh, great night of fellowship and, and fun here in Toledo. I hate that that's the night. I'm out of town that night. So. Oh. I, was love, I love walleye games. So. I'll eat a hot dog for you. Do that. Have a beer. <laughs> God's blessings on your week. We'll see you.